This is Smart Investing with Mike Rand. Securities and advisory service offered through KMS Financial Services. This is Smart Investing with Michael J. Rand. With Michael's producer, Chris Martin. You can email us your questions. Go to smartinvestingshow.com to see how. For I have the pride, the privilege, nay, the pleasure of introducing to you the one, the only. This is Smart Investing with Mike Rand. Hello there, everybody. You have tuned back into and booted up another podcast of the Smart Investing Show, where we try to take the topic of investing. And number one, we try to make it easier to understand. Number two, we try to get you good, relevant information on each and every show. And thirdly, we try to be entertaining. And with the entertaining part, that usually means Mr. Chris Martin is going to say something enlightening or funny, or he gets me to say something funny. So uh, the entertaining portion, Chris, take it away. No, oh, <laughs> tell me a joke, funny man. Yeah, yeah, how's it going today? That's going all right. That's good. That's good. I, uh, I went to the open mic night. Yeah, last night or uh, last week. Did it go pretty okay? Yeah, I got some laughs. Good. You didn't get right. slaughtered. No, I okay. made fun of my daughter's cancer. So that. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's always good. It's always good. I ran the bit by her just to make sure. <laughs> No, a lot of it was I. I talked about how do people lean back in the chair a little bit? A little bit. There Perfect. was there was some quiet before I said it's got a happy ending. Relax. <laughs> but a lot of it has to do with when I took her down to Deaconess. They have that parkade because you know getting a handicap spot in front of a hospital is pointless. Yeah. But there's a guy in there in the booth that still has to charge you money when you leave. So no matter what the diet, like if he said your daughter's going to die tonight, there's still a guy in that booth that has to go. That's gonna be three dollars. Oh. Just, <laughs> I just thought that's the worst job ever. Just it was people crying. Oh, did your dad die? That's gonna be three dollars. <laughs> <Just>, yeah, <laughs> that's kind of like my industry. No, <laughs> <laughs> just did your husband die? No, I'm no. Sorry. Do you want to switch those stocks over? Mike lost all your money. Hi, here's your bill. No, oh. <laughs> here's your bill. Yeah, <laughs> I try to hide the bill. You know. Like, do you put it in a Christmas card? No, slip it in their purse when they're not looking. Oh, okay, that's you good. Know? Yeah, yeah, you know, try to... When you give them a hug, put it in their pocket. Exactly. <laughs> you know, the opposite of a pickpocket, a put-in pocket. <laughs> I don't know what you call that. They get home, take their pants off. What is this? <laughs> What's oh, a bill from Mike Wren? <laughs> <laughs> put it in a fortune cookie. Oh, that would be good. Yeah. Have personalized fortune cookies. Oh, there you go. You chose the wrong one. Oh, try next sorry. time. <laughs> yeah. Try again later. Okay, everybody, you you're, you booted up the podcast for some sort of advice here. So here's here's a uh, or some sort of guidance. Um, let me let me start by saying that sometimes I feel like I'm living in Bizarro World because uh, there's so many shows and topics and people talking about stuff that really doesn't have a hell of a lot to do with reality and it I think it started in my industry I think my industry was the first one to just grab on to computer technology to make things more efficient and to help you know to help review companies and so on and the journalists got a hold of it and it it just seems like my industry has bastardized reality almost as bad as Facebook has well didn't it I mean, once the 24-hour news cycle started, yeah, maybe, they didn't have anything else to talk about. Maybe it's their fault. Yeah, it's it's their fault. They kept having to have <laughs> segments. <laughs> what I mean by this is uh, one of my favorite podcasts that I listen to, just for entertaining because it's uh, it, it'll, it'll engage. Sometimes they're too boring to even listen to. <laughs> Some of them are really good. And it's Malcolm Gladwell, that author of all those popular books, you know, the uh, What the Dog Saw. The uh, David and Goliath, Blink, you know, not Blink 182, but Blink. Oh, uh, might be putting in the wrong CD. Yeah. So anyway, these books are extremely popular. And so his podcast is called Revisionist History, and it tends to be somewhat popular as well. It's, it's somebody who writes really well, who's smart enough to make it interesting. That's, so that's better than a lot of the stuff out there. You know, he... He doesn't so much have an axe to grind sometimes as he wants to show a different view or, you know, show stuff in its real light. Anyway, one of the podcasts that I was listening to 
Uh, he mentioned something called the Social Science Research Network, and it's, S it's SSRN.com. And what it is, is it is a place on the internet where really smart, really nerdy people go out there and they post their own research papers. So we're talking, we're talking people that, um, they're not geniuses, but we're talking everything from high, high level math, mathematicians to doctors. We're talking tons of professors. So you're not talking like, like the kids in Big Bang Theory that are going to IT. You're talking like actual professionals at, at their job putting these? Both. Oh, okay. Anybody can actually post oh, on okay. there. And they, they want, you know, because in science, it's not so much about fighting and jousting out in the open like cage fighting. It's somebody will put their idea out there in a research paper, and they want other smart people to offer an oh, opinion okay, to it. rebut it, okay? So the name of the website is SSRN.com, uh, Social Science Research Network. And Malcolm Gladwell was speaking about this, so at the end of whatever I was doing, I went on there. And it's like, okay, I wonder I can, where I can find something in my industry. So I did. <clears throat> and let me tell you, I don't know. It's, of course, it was Eugene Fama from the University of Chicago had the majority of the posts on there. And I want to just, you know, it's far enough before Christmas that I could use every other word as the F word right now, but I'm going, I'm not going to, I'm going to try to express myself, not like a commercial fisherman for once. So anyway, it's so depressing to somebody like me to hear nothing but this diatribe spewed out of the butthole of somebody that is a professor at a well-known college that never runs any goddamn money. Okay, let me just say that. Is that where's his mutual fund that he runs? Where's his portfolio? He doesn't do anything. He has all of these uh, opinions, and one of them is called modern portfolio theory, which is a theory. It's not gravity. It's not a rule. It's a freaking theory. And he's got 10 or 15 of these research papers on there with him and some of his cohorts and so on. And when I'm I'm only going to use this as a stepping stone to what I really want to talk about on the podcast, so you don't have to worry about me being, you know, ranting and raving for the rest of the time. But let's let's use this podcast, you and the four people that are listening to it. <laughs> uh, let's use this as a point in time to figure out what the hell are we trying to do and what is investing trying to do, okay? Because when I go to other people, when I, when I see what other people in my industry are doing and I listen to what other people in the industry are talking about, I don't talk that way. I don't think that way. In fact, I have no idea what they're on about. I have no idea in hell what these people are talking about because they're talking about risk-reward ratios and how they can use mathematical theory to, uh, to search out an algorithm that will a enable us to hop into some sector of the economy or some sector of the stock market that's going up and some sector of the st and avoid the sectors of the stock market going down. What the hell are they talking about? Are these people never going to realize that you have to deal with the public in some way by selling a product or a service to make some money? Are they trying to sound smarter so you, oh, those guys must no, know something? No, I think we've gone past the point now, kind of like Facebook. Facebook is not talking face-to-face. -face. It's people hiding behind anonymity, anonymity of a computer or they... It's a personification of themselves where they're willing to say stuff basically through a keyboard that they would never be willing to say face to face. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I have seen that many times. Okay. Well, I think that's a negative version of what humans take communication to, but my industry now. It seems like most people in my industry are talking about a theory, about a theory, about this idea that was from that conjecture that somebody said so long ago that they forget where, where the hell this even started. And like I said on last week's podcast, I believe, or two weeks ago, where 
everybody wants to invest in the index or the index is the benchmark by where everything on earth is judged now, where the heck did that come from? You know, just because Jim, uh, just because Jim or John Bogle, I think it's John Bogle, just because the founder of Vanguard, John Bogle, figured out that a lot of people sucked at what they did, and he said, well, you could just do better by putting it in the index, all of a sudden, that's become the benchmark that everybody's graded on, or what everybody wants, or what everybody talks about is the benchmark that's better than other people stealing or sucking? That's the benchmark? How about the benchmark would be just making a good real rate of return, real rate of return, real real money that you're making over time. How about, why, why can't we just talk about making money over time? Like somebody who would own a dry cleaners, somebody that would own a 7-Eleven, somebody that would own this or that. Why can't we do that? Because those folks out there, they're not listening to Eugene Fama's principle on modern portfolio theory. They're not worried about asset allocation. They're figuring out how much of what product to put in their store to sell maximizes their profits. How much that somebody puts on their website, how much they can sell of that, and how they can advertise their website, get their name out there to make that, you know, that, that's, that's real that's real economics. You're not talking about some stupid theory. And so most of the people in my industry now are talking about risk reward. Well, if we put so much in bonds and so much in stock, then the blended return, nobody's talking about what you're actually doing. When we're investing, we're actually trying to put our money into something that will increase over time. And typically what works better is when folks, their houses, when they invest in their own house, it's tangible, they can see and touch it, and it's got a pretty big dose of reality because they're in the house the whole time. They typically will improve the house as the years go by, so it ends up to be one of their better investments. So you have my industry talking about wonderful cockamamie ideas and theories about what people should talk about. And then you have the normal human condition, which, which sucks right off the bat. The normal human condition is garnered by fear and greed. So when you add fear and greed, and you add that little concoction to my industry that wants to make it self-important, wants to make everything extraordinarily complicated, so you have to use my industry to make sure that you can get going forward, when you blend those two things, you get a bucket of crap, okay? Because one, one thing is always wrong, which is going to be the behavior of the investor, and the other thing is wrong probably a lot of the time because they just want to sell something, which is my industry. So you have a marriage of two idiots. And you think they're going to have genius kids? No, they're not. <laughs> Chris is wanting to jump in there. Yeah, no. I, anything I say is going to probably insult people that I know. So anyway, well, yeah, people that I know, I, I can't go further because that would be relatives, I think. <laughs> that was my thought. So anyway, think about it. Let's take let, let's let's take the first portion of this relationship. Let's take the let's take the individual investor out there. Okay? Most people panic and most people panic. I guess that's you don't need to say anything more. All people panic eventually <clears throat> at some point. Yeah, most people are impatient. So, let's say that they have uh, invested in something. They constantly want to look at it and see what's going on, even though it's been a week or a month or a year. It'd be like planting a tree in your backyard and wondering if it was growing and you can't really tell if the upper part's growing. So you dig up the roots to see if they're any bigger or any stronger. It's like, oh, I don't see any difference. You pat it back down. And then you dig the sucker up again in another week. It's like, I just can't tell if it's growing or not. You know, it's, there's not enough leaves and not enough shade. So people, people are, their impatiency kind of or, screws with the person. Or do you have a spouse going, ah, I don't think it's growing. Do you think it's growing? I don't think it's growing. You should go check. You should exactly. go check and see if it's growing. Exactly. You've got people. You, Pete, you just I have, just called Mike. Mike said it's growing. I don't know if it's growing or not. You should dig it up. You're right. You've got people being people. So people, people's propensity to try to see a pattern where none exists, 
people's propensity to panic for some unknown reason and people's propensity to be impatient derail their investments. That's what happens. Let's call a spade a spade, everybody. What the hell is everybody worried about? You have my industry, CNBC, journalists, and folks talking when the next recession is going to come. Recession does not equal death. Recession is a slowing of the economy that happens in a regular fashion just as much as when the economy is growing. You have ebbs and flows like wintertime and summer, spring and fall. It's a season. It's kind of a cycle, kind of a growth pattern that doesn't happen on any regular time. You know, it's not dependent on the azimuth of the sun hitting, sun's rays hitting the earth. It's not dependent on anything like that. It just kind of happens. Yet people focus on that. People will continuously focus on the daily news and they act like it's going to kill them. So they panic and they wonder how come they're not making any money. It's because of them. They look in the mirror. That's the problem. You're panicking. You're impatient. Everybody that talks about every single news article that you've ever read about the stock market crashing and, you know, it never making you any money, all of them have always been wrong because it's always been temporary. Everybody wants to extrapolate that negative news is essentially going to be permanent. And that's never been the case. If it was the case, the market wouldn't exist. If human existence was negative, we wouldn't be talking here. Some flu virus would have wiped us out on the earth by now. Okay? So unless it's a comet hitting the earth, I don't know what everybody in the world is so worried about. Because they're thinking that all of these negative actions that happen normally in the market are going to go to zero and going to be permanent, even though that's never happened. And especially my industry feeds into that. So that's me done beating up on the individual investor. People just panic and they're completely impatient. You add that to my industry. The, uh, my industry now talks about theories and they hype about the negatives in the world d d ad nauseum. They never ever talk about, well, when we're investing, we can either be a, a lender or an owner. We can either lend somebody money and have them pay us back a certain stated rate of interest, or we can own a business. They're talking about risk reward ratios, asset allocation. Then they're going to talk about annuities and harp the fear mongering thing again and say, gosh, you can't trust anything nowadays. Maybe we should just give our money to an insurance company, hold our heads low and take that guarantee for the rest of our life, which is okay if that's what you want. Because on the flip side of me beating up on all the individual investors in the world, I'm the one guy that also realizes that 90% of the people on the street don't want to be an investor. They would rather just have somebody tell them that you're going to get this much of a check every single month for the rest of your life and everything's going to be okay. Why do you think communism was such a big hit so many years ago? That's not too far of a, that's not too much of a difference. People don't want to seek out and conquer. They just want to be, they want to have this, you know, some blanket of security, which I'm okay with that as long as the person can describe to me what it is that they want, what their true person is. If they're not a swashbuckling person and they don't believe in investing and don't believe that they can be successful, well then definitely take the guarantee. But you have to be okay with yourself. So, you know, I'm ranting and raving a lot, but it's needed because we're talking about what the real issues are. Real issues are completely bad behavior on the individual investor. And you have my industry trying to come up with every single product to try to lure all those bad investors into one place. It's why I don't like mutual funds. Mutual funds are typically run by a pretty darn well-informed money manager that left to their own devices, they would like to make more money. But what usually derails them is the shareholders of that said XYZ mutual fund panic out at the very opportunity that presents itself for the manager. In other words, a down market. When you have prices going down, the manager can buy wonderful companies at a lower price. 
but they never get to do it because the individual investors panic out because they can see the performance now almost real time on the internet and they see the prices going down they equate that with something that's negative and short term they want their money back so it doesn't go down any further and so they never give it enough time never give it enough time for it to grow and they always take the money away from the professional investor at the very, very time that the professional investor can typically do them good. Is it because, like, all this talk about a recession and a recession, yeah, like, the, the only time that, is it because maybe people think, well, the last time it was a recession, it led to, like, lines for bread and and black and white no, photos no. of people it's like no that might that might have been a depression is what you're thinking of yeah but okay. is that when people hear the word recession is that what they think like it's not just going to go down a little bit if it's going to go down to everyone's going to be broke and no if, jobs if they have a really low iq yeah that's what okay. they think uh. <laughs> and if they're completely non-red and illiterate of course that's what they think also, if they're really, really smart, but they let the in, they let their emotions get the best of them all the time, of course that's what they're going to think. What I don't get is people, you literally will have people from my industry saying, a recession is coming, so we should do this and this and this to protect ourselves. And my idea is to protect ourselves from what and how long? If this recession is going to be a couple years, what do I care? What do I care? It's two years. You but, know? I, but I think as you were saying that, I'm thinking that's the guy that's saying, uh, I, I can do more for, I can, I can look like I'm working. Let's protect ourselves. So for the next couple of years, you're going to pay me a little more to make it look like I'm working for you or, to help you. Or not pay me a little bit more, but let's do this and this and this. They harp the fear. Let's protect ourselves from the recession. What the hell are you protecting yourself from? It's a temporary constriction of the economy until it starts growing again and it doesn't mean that a recession do you think people quit shopping at costco no so i would assume i would think that costco will probably continue to pay a dividend during that time so capture the dividend and insert the name of pretty much any company that you can think of comma that's publicly traded comma that you spend money with weekly period that's Verizon, Exxon Mobil, Shell Oil. Um, if you're a smoker, those things. Procter Gamble, maybe for soap. I mean, come on. You're spending money every day. I know that because the economy's growing right now. Who are you sending your payments to? For the car, for the house? Who's the bank? Who's the credit union? Who's the payment processor? Blah, 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 blah. I could go on and on and on. There's stuff happening no matter what people are telling you on the internet and people are panicking for some reason that that's i just kind of roll my eyes and have to take a deep breath when somebody wants to be reassured from the next recession because i feel like saying to them how old are you are we on, are we in preschool don't you realize now that none of this is going to kill you it's a temporary thing the the whole stream upward is look at spokane look how many people live here now Look how look how busy the valley is. Look how look how connected the valley is to Post Falls to Coeur d'Alene. That's the ever marching on of time. Time is relentless. Okay, make it work for you instead of against you. The growing of the population, the longer that people live, the new technologies out there that people must have that they that they think that it betters their life. Own those companies, okay? Own those companies. Those companies typically are going to succeed over time because they're doing it well. Do you think for some reason people are just going to automatically and arbitrarily say, I'm going to shop less at Amazon? No, they, if they had a good experience, it's like, well, I didn't have to drive to the mall. I didn't have to go from the South Hill to the North Side or vice versa or from the Valley all the way to the North Side. I, I would rather go to a colonoscopy than do that. So let's, why don't I just shop on the internet? Because the drivers suck anyway. Everybody's texting. It might be slick roads. There you go. Do you think people are going to shop less at Amazon? I 
I highly doubt that. I think that they're going to try to utilize it more. And this isn't a solicitation to buy or sell. This is just to try to get you, the very few podcast listeners on this thing, to you already kind of a drank if you know about this podcast you probably have you know taken a sip of mike wren's kool-aid where it's like quit worrying and just march on and make some money own these really good companies long term own them but yet my industry they play on all of the fears and they realize that they there should be a disclaimer about every investment television show on cnbc and every time they come back from commercial break, I think they should, they should be forced to say, remember, this is just an editorialized news broadcast. We're trying to build interest. This, fill some time. We're trying to fill some time. You should not act on any of these news items just because they pique your attention. You should research them more. You should think about your personal situation. And, you know, remember, things aren't going just... Just well, remember that. Back when we were on the actual radio, didn't they have you, they wanted you to, to, to call up and do like a Mike's Money Report thing. Yeah. But it's like, you can only do that so many times before it's like, what you're I... either repeating yourself or yeah. you're making stuff up because you got to fill the time. Yeah, they wanted me to do the morning and afternoon market reports. I would, you know, no. I would rather go in for a root canal. Because the root canal at some point in time will end. That 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 kind of bullshit never ends. It's, it's never ending. It's time filler. Yeah. And so what I mean is make the... Mar- we all are getting older. We know what it's like when Mother Nature messes with us and Father Time messes with us. What I'm trying to t- do for most people is trying to at least a lot of that action can be negative towards a human being getting older mother nature father time working on us i try to flip that coin and make that relentless march of time work for you the first thing you must not do is panic because if you've been alive this long to invest you realize that panicking doesn't do any good and there's rarely rarely an event so meaningful that you should panic Okay, calm down. Do something rather than be on the internet and do something rather than know what the news is talking about. feel like throwing up in my own mouth even giving that (laughs) advice. Just don't listen to the news anymore. They don't know anything. And guess what? It's already happened. So, da-da-da, I don't know why anybody freaks out about it. Or just... Stop for like like two days and notice the difference. Yeah. So things aren't going to change. Human behavior is not going to change. What anybody's talking about on CNBC or in my industry, human behavior is not going to change. The yahoos that are on the radio that are trying to sell you annuities, they're trying to tell you that the world is going to end and you're never going to be happy. I would tend to agree with them if you can never get good advice and get a hold of your own emotions. So if you can never get a hold of your own emotions and you're always going to be distrusting, then some sort of an investment product that gives you a guarantee is exactly what you need. Because you need the guarantee to sleep at night. And this is only money. It's not about your happiness. So if that product makes a person more secure and happy, that is exactly what you should do. My, my uh, disclaimer is I realize that only 10% of the population or less should be investors. That's who I'm talking to. So nine out of every 10 people, I already know. Intuitively, I don't want to talk to. They don't care what I'm saying either. So it's a match made in right. heaven. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's not that it's, it's not no that big deal. they don't have any interest. It's you're not saying what they want to hear. It's the yeah. I'm not trying to sell them anything. It's like truly, are you an investor? Because if you're not, you're not going to be happy. So it's like you know, this is a for most people out there, they're going to think quote unquote, this is a rough ride. Do you think it's going to be a rough ride? It might be. Okay, then I don't think you should get on. Mm-hmm. And somebody that's more seasoned and say, yeah, what's rough? You know, it's it's life. Then it's like oh, somebody that's actually calm. Yeah, I would love talking to you about, you know, investing. Mm. So I already get right off the bat that what I do, most people don't want to be involved in. Perfect. 
I that's that, that <laughs> I, I don't want you. Yeah, I don't want you there. Do yeah. Do I want to be involved with most people? That would be no. It's like in Thanksgiving when the family goes, let's go outside and play some touch football, and I come out. And they're like, well, I know Chris has no interest in it, but I know he's here, but we don't want him on our team. So, <laughs> so anyway, that's that's what's that's the first thing, is that just calm down. Quit panicking about everything that everybody talks about. And my industry, I don't know what it is they're on about. I simply want my clients to own a good investment, if it's possible, for the rest of their life. Okay. A lot of folks that own a really, really good family-owned business, that's what happens. A big farm would be that way. A successful restaurant, a successful dry cleaners, you have to say successful in front of it because if it's not, they're not going to be there. So out here in the valley, there's that Ron's Drive-In that's been out there for years and years and years. It's a, it's a continuing entity. Most of those Chinese restaurants on division. So you, you know those types of maybe family-owned companies that continue on going. What about a McDonald's? The franchise owner, you know the name McDonald's because it's a corporate trademark name, but you probably don't know the name of the family that owns the McDonald's that you frequent. Guarantee you that that's a going concern. So those people, that's what they do for the rest of their life. So I try to be somewhere in the middle where you, the investor, it's like, hey, man, we want to own the good companies, and we would rather them make so much money that there's really not a reason for us to sell them, period. There's a few really good publicly traded companies out there. More than a few, but it's not all of them. I don't want to own everything. I want to own the ones that they kind of have built trust with me over the years. And how do you build trust? Well, by being predictable and consistent. If you have those two characteristics, you typically start to engender trust in some fashion, whether it's a human relationship or whether it's a financial one. If there's predictability and consistency, well, then you can kind of start to trust what's going on, right? You kind of have the the same boss for years and just same model, stuff like that. Yeah, or yeah, it, the bosses will change, but the same dogma, the same the same behaviors. Mm. You know, just like just think of it as a relationship with another person. If they're predictable and consistent, you can count on them. And being able to count on them is kind of a different way of saying trust, right? I got to call my wife. <laughs> She has made a terrible mistake. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, isn't that correct, though? I mean, it's pretty simple. Predictability and consistency. So, I mean, who wants to go to work with with, uh, up and downs? You want to go to work, you'll keep your workers if everything just remains the same. Yeah, and if you can improve it over time. Yeah. Okay, so when you're investing, the predictability, you can't predict the future. So you're basically looking at predictability within a range and those people the my industry in the news media they shrink that range down to a penny whether it's a positive penny or a or a negative penny they shrink it down to a negative or a positive and that's it and i have to tell you when you're in business there's a lot of variables Widen that range a little bit to what you're going to be okay with long term. Obviously, you don't want to be losing pennies every single day for forever. But when you have, you know, earnings come in and, you know, a lot of times they'll make news that, oh, the earnings should have been $2 a share, but it's $1.95. So the company's down a whole bunch. Why the hell is it down a whole bunch? It's five cents. Of course, it's big, big money, but I mean, there has to be a range. Things, quote unquote, happen. So there's a lot of companies out there that you can't, I can't predict, and you can't predict that you're always going to make money. But I'm going to tell you, there's quite a few of them that are very consistent within a range and predictable within a range. And that's where I try to invest. And when people start panicking about uh, some certain XYZ company that's still profitable, that's still paying dividends, and people have all of a sudden thrown the baby out with the bathwater, and, oh, that bad news, I'm just, I don't like that, where the price is down, well, that's a buying opportunity. Right then and there, that's like your favorite garage sale or your favorite antique store. 
because you like that when you can find something that will typically cost you $20 for whatever it is, and you go to the garage sale and you can get it for two or three or four or five. Isn't that what people are after? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people are happy. Very, very happy. And the ones that don't are uh, unstable. Yeah. You don't want that negativity in your life. Yeah. People. Get rid of those people. Well, that's the thing. People are. I lost a little bit of my train of thought because it's just it's just pure common sense to me. But I don't know. I don't know. I know that people are so emotional. But if they would just, I guess what I want folks to do is I want them to tell an accurate story to themselves about the investment world instead of a story that's been told to them by my industry or by a coworker or by somebody that doesn't have that doesn't have their own emotions in check and I want it to be the most accurate story that they can tell themselves the accurate story is nothing has ever gone to zero worldwide mm-hmm. there you go Certain companies have gone to zero. That's why you just don't put all of your money into one company, though a lot of people do when they own, you know. But you've also said a lot of times is don't invest if you can't. Right. So if you're constantly worried, you probably shouldn't have put all your eggs in that one basket. You or should have put several. the eggs that you could afford to. Yeah, and a lot yeah, that's the one thing is it has to be I never want people to invest huge, you know, all of their money. I want them to start small. If they have a hundred thousand dollars, I would rather tell them. I would rather them just say, "I'm comfortable with investing ten of that and keeping the other ninety in the bank." And mm-hmm. I'd say, "Perfect." But my industry wouldn't. My industry wants to gather assets and say, "Well, you don't have to keep it all in the bank. All that ninety, we we might be able to have other quote unquote safe areas to put it." That's a slippery slope. Stick mm-hmm. with, I'm, they're trying to change that person's emotions right there before anything's ever happened. And I'd rather not try to change that person's emotions right then and there. I'd rather say, invest the 10. Keep the 90 in the bank. And that way you can see how this 10 behaves. And then once you start to have a positive experience, and once you start to, move, you know, once you are dealing with that investment moving up and down in the volatility, once you experience that, then we can start to move forward. And only after that, you just, my industry is trying to talk people into things when they don't have any experience. So it's like, you have to shrink, I, I, you have to shrink the possibilities down in the beginning. I wonder if you should have like a questionnaire and the only question should be, how many times a day do you look at the newspaper or the financial thing on the news? And if it's like more than once a week. Well, you know, there are some people, though. So I have some clients that will check their investments either daily or every other day. But for some reason, they're not sociopaths. They don't try to. Uh, mm. they, they, it, they're not freaks. They, you think it's just out of habit? It's they're reassuring themselves in some way that you would think would be derailing the whole kit and caboodle, but they're not. Hmm. That for some reason they can look at it daily and it doesn't cause anxiety. That's the word oh, I'm looking okay. for. They they were doing something that is okay to them that's not anxiety producing. But you're right. Most people that do check their investment every single day or check, you know, the news or whatever, they it produces anxiety with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're right. Most of them, I'm seeing all these big birds fly out the window behind you here and fly around outside. Of oh, yeah, they're waiting for me. I think, they're uh, vultures and yeah, I'm think, really old. I think I've really made some gods mad out there. Now Alfred Hitchcock is coming to life. <laughs> <laughs> they're waiting for me to keel over. There's yeah, a so, lot of them lately. Yeah, so we didn't talk about any companies and anything specific, but maybe we touched about enough emotions out there and enough of my industry's diatribe about these theories where – I don't think I beat it up hard enough. They're talking about theories of how to make money. Let's talk about the concrete facts of how to make money and move from there. Because my industry is really not talking hardly ever about anything concrete anymore. It's some long, drawn-out sales process. And uh, 
They're trying to sell you products. Do you have anything to add to that? I Mr. really don't. Chris? Okay. Well, let's wrap her up. These don't, right. ever, these don't ever have to, these podcasts don't have to be the exact same length every time. I'm sure some of the listeners would rather some of them end early. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, if you could just make them about two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody. Well, thanks uh, for listening to this podcast as always. We, uh, if you have any feedback for us, contact us. Tell them how to do that. Right. In fact, I usually just put it in the show notes, uh, smartinvestingshow at gmail.com for your comments and questions. Uh, if you have any, uh, if you want to look Mike up and see what he looks like, you can always go to smartinvestingshow.com. <laughs> That's got all the links to the Facebook page, the YouTube page, where I'll put in uh, the audio so you can cruise the internet while you're listening. <laughs> uh, and okay. then if you if you uh, like the Facebook page, you'll get a reminder every time a new show comes up. Okay, so. great. Well, again, thanks once again for listening. If you ever want to contact me directly, just pick up the phone, 747 747- Five one eight. Excuse me. Seven four seven five one eight one. Area code five zero nine. Dial me up and let's talk. Thanks again for listening. If you didn't have a pen, go to smartinvestingshow.com and it's right there. Any opinions expressed here and are given in good faith and are subject to change without notice and are correct only on the stated date of issue. Past performance is not always indicative of future results. This material is not intended as an offer or solicitation for the purchase or sale of any security or other financial instrument. Security financial instruments or strategies mentioned may not be suitable for all investors. Prices, values, or income from any investment mentioned in this report may fall against the interest of the investor and the investor may get back less than the amount invested. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs and is not intended as a recommendation of particular securities, financial instruments, or strategies to you. Before acting on any recommendation on this material, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and, if necessary, seek professional advice.